that are coming up. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't know if I should record after I introduced her before, but thank you so much. Um, so just as a reminder, each paper is going to be about 15 minutes. I'll uh, ping you in the chat speakers at once you have like two minutes to go. And then ah, stop. Um, sorry, my phone's going off. And what was I going to say about that? Ah, and then we're going to save questions for the end. But as the talks are going on, you are welcome to log them in the Q&A part of the chat or in, over in the Discord. And so without any further ado, we're just going to follow in the order that's on the program, which means we're starting with Jonathan Harriton, who's going to be talking to us about regionalizing board game research. So thank you so much, Jonathan. Take it away. Okay, testing, testing, is everything good? Hopefully, no answer, okay. I'm gonna start anyway, if there are any issues, okay, I see a thumbs up, perfect. So hello everyone, thank you for listening. My name is Jonathan Harrington. I'm currently a, a researcher at Hong Kong Baptist University, which is where I am right now. If I make any mistakes, please bear with me, it's a little bit late, and this is way past my normal bedtime. But without further ado, let's get into it. So. There we go. Uh, the basic premise of this paper is that while we have terms like Eurogame and Amerigame, we don't have similar terms for games within East Asia. Uh, when we talk about Eurogames and Amerigames, part of the reason we're talking about these is based on convention, uh, just, just terms that got picked up. However, there's also this appreciation that when these games came out and as these games progressed, they came out of something whether it is the Amerigame coming slightly from a tradition of wargaming, whether it is the Eurogame coming out slightly from a tradition of German family games, there was a precedent to them that led them to become what they are. And now we can appreciate that they have certain qualities to them which make them unique. And perhaps we can be looking at similar terms for East Asian games especially, that appreciate this. Like for example, to the left over there, there's a game by Eten, a game, a Japanese company, make lovely games. And there's something about it, to me at least, that is perennially Japanese, whether it is the minimalist art, the focused on tactility, the fact that it's a very social endeavor, it stands out to me as necessarily coming from Japan, and it'll be interesting to explore why. In this presentation, I will not give answers. However, I will give the things that I'm currently looking at as conditions that might lead for things to be the way they are, so to speak. A brief outlook of what I'm doing right now, I'm conducting an, a, largely an astrography of board games within East Asia. I'm going to board game conventions such as Board Game Fiesta in Korea last May, uh, a week ago, actually like two, three days ago now. Uh, the book fair in Hong Kong had quite a few board game stands. In September, I'll be going to Taiwan to Toby, focusing a lot on modern board games. Uh, talking to players, talking to publishers, talking to designers, and seeing what makes the scene over there thick. Uh, in this way, I'm doing a little bit of assemblage building. I'm starting or heavily focusing on the Hong Kong board game scene because this is where I'm based. Recently got funding to really study the production, design, distribution, cafes, players, so on and so forth. And hopefully over time, I'll expand this to other regions, starting from Hong Kong, moving on to the larger Sinosphere, and then looking at East Asia and beyond. So if anyone is also doing this, or you know people that are interested, whether in PhDs or anything similar, please let me know. I want to build a little bit of a lab over here doing this stuff. I'll also be referring to a mini study, part of the assemblage building I just discussed, where I looked at two meetup groups. Uh, one is called Oasis and one is called BGHK. Oasis is Anglophone, BGHK is Cantophone. And here I looked at the different games they played, where, when, with who, uh, the weight of their games, distribution, language dependency, and I saw very stark differences. For those who aren't aware, I should have said this before, Meetup is an online app where people can meet other people interested in similar hobbies, and these are both hosted there, uh, despite striking difference in the way they play. So let's start with the first points that I want to look at very briefly, which is the idea of location. Uh, I'm originally from Europe, and for most people I know that get into board games in Europe, it's happening a lot from TCG or TTRPG or wargaming traditions where they go inside the shop, they're playing things like Magic or Warhammer, 
And the same shops also stock board games. And then they buy a board game and playing with their family or with their friends. And those people also get into the hobby. So those are the two big ways that people tended to get into board games within my circle. Uh, the cafe model is slowly growing. Uh, I do see cafes in Europe stemming up, for example, in London, there's drafts. And here we see that there's an entry fee or a buy a drink fee, and then you can stay for as long as you like. However, as Donovan points out, this idea of the cafe is very much an Asian thing. It started off in Seoul in Korea. He argues that's the first one, and they haven't found anything to disprove it yet. And I argue that the reason why they started there isn't from a large board game tradition, but rather because there was an idea model which was very popular for this sort of thing, which is the PC Bang model. In China, we had the Wang Baz. And basically, these are internet cafes where people go, pay a small entry fee, top up every hour, and then play games as they go along. So even just from the model itself, on one hand, we have the hobbyist shop and the cafe, which allow you to stay as long as you want, as long as you pay the entry to this PC Bang model we can see that the length of the games will also be necessarily different. If you're paying by the hour, you want to get the most out of your buck. However, in the same way, I also saw that, at least within a Chinese context, the idea of table play as social lubricant is incredibly common, even before modern board games. The idea of having 10-hour mahjong sessions. There was recently a talk by Ting Ting Liao in a conference in uh, Australia, where she discussed this a little bit as well. 10-hour uh, mahjong sessions are commonplace, seeing older people, especially in parks, playing Xiangxi or Weizi for hours on end as people pass them by is very common. The idea of sitting down around the table and playing games is something that is socially inbuilt. And this idea of games as being complementary to socialization is not necessarily unique, but it's very heavily pronounced even within the research I've done so far where even the games that people are playing within BGHK, the Cantophone group I looked at, are heavily focused on socialization. Light games are more popular, repeating the same game over and over is more popular, social deduction games are more popular. If I can give a comparison, the most commonly played game in Oasis, the Anglophone group, was Terraforming Mars, which was played six times. However, the most commonly played game within BGHK was Werewolf, which was played 20 times. And here the reasons become a little bit obvious. If the game is lighter, you can talk more. If you repeat the same game over and over, then there's less rule teach and less awkwardness around trying to make sure everyone is understanding the rules. And social deduction is a mechanic that encourages socialization. It's within the name. And this socialization as complementary part of the games can also be seen in the way the events are coded. Titles such as Ladies Advantage within board, board game events are very common on BGHK. The idea that if you're a woman, you get 20 bucks off on your entry, 20 Hong Kong dollars or 2.5 US dollars, something like that. Uh, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing for inclusivity, I'm not sure. I want to research it a little bit further, but it is quite common. And there are common primary socialization activities. 50% of these happen during the weekend. Uh, large participant numbers, eight plus. They emphasize party and you'll be welcoming. Like even in this photo over here at the bottom one, that is the BGHK group. You can see that there's like this title in its social environment, even within the photos they take. However, it's not just about location. One thing which is heavily influencing the games that people play is platform centralization. Uh, crowdfunding is directing the way modern board gaming is going. Not dictating, but it is directing it in specific directions. Uh, and I can see why smaller companies use something like Kickstarter or GameFound. It reduces heavily stocking issues because you know how big your print run will be. Direct to consumer reduces certain costs because you remove middlemen, even though Kickstarter and GameFound are also middlemen. Perhaps most interestingly, the idea of a Kickstarter board game is starting to emerge which is, for example, if we look at something like a miniature game, putting that on a store shelf would be a little bit tricky because the games are big, the games are expensive, and the audience for it might be a little bit small and scattered. But as soon as you put it on Kickstarter, you, all the people that are interested can congregate there, and it creates a sort of community that Tinny, Kalea, Booth all talk about, 
of people that go to crowdfunding websites because they know that's where their big games will be, not on store shelves. However, even this way, it promotes a certain level of inclusivity for East Asian players and Southeast Asian players, especially, there is a large degree of exclusivity from the hobby and also from new games. We have ideas such as payment issues over Kickstarter and GameFound. I think it's only recently that Kickstarter started accepting UnionPay as a way for people to pay, which meant that for a long time, mainland Chinese players just could not buy things over Kickstarter since it's the most common credit card that most people would have. Smaller print runs are becoming more popular now because Kickstarter acts as a way of gauging interest in your new game where you see how much it prints and if it prints a lot, you approach localizers afterwards and tell them it did very well. Are you interested in translating it? Which means secondary languages have to wait up quite a while. And of course there's shipping issues. We discussed this a little bit on the discords today already where the idea of shipping a game to Indonesia or Malaysia will cost you 35, 40 bucks, which is almost the entire cost of the board game. And the currency does not go as far as the US dollar and the USA would go. So justifying buying board games for Southeast Asian players over at least crowdfunding websites is very hard. So then we get splintering communities. We get language target advertising. We get each country creating their own crowdfunding website. So they get the crowdfunding experience, even though the game doesn't need to be crowdfunded because it's already out. So in China, there is Modian. In Taiwan, we see Wabai and Zuzu. In Korea, we see Tumblebug and Wadiz. Even in Europe, we see something like Spiel Offensive in Germany. Lots of different language communities creating their own crowdfunding websites to still be part of the larger discourse, even though the discourse has already passed them within the English sphere, so to speak. And once again, this influences the games that people play. Less language means the game is, makes it easier to socialize. However, it's also just a matter of retail games are more likely to be translated into their core languages. For example, in the research I've done, 46 of 47 retail games that players in BGHK played uh, had no language dependency. 40 were in Chinese, six were in English with no language dependency, only one had dependency. But then when it got to crowdfunding games, the most recent games, the ones that people are most excited about, so to speak, there was a lot more dependency and these games were played a lot less. And then we see the community splintering a little bit as well because they create separate content. For example, these are two Cantophon creators. They have strong followings in the thousands and they create content very often. However, they're primarily based for Cantonese or at least people that can read traditional Chinese. On the other hand, more regional content, like within the larger East Asia, tends to use English, whether it is Singaporean creators and Malaysian creators like Board Game Joel and Table Topping, diaspora creators, uh, Tay Eats Tea, for example, is a very popular Korean Canadian, and dual language posting. So Domo Board Games is a Taiwanese creator that posts in both traditional Chinese and English. Uh, Bain is also a content creator from Korea, both in Korean and English. They realize that there is a splintering community, but they try to join it, one, for their own personal channel growth, but also because they know quite a few people want to be part of this discourse happening within crowdfunding websites, but are blocked out because of language restrictions. Uh, two minutes left, so I'll conclude a little bit quickly in terms of aesthetics. Of course, apart from material issues, there's also aesthetics coming into play. The boundaries of cute, cool, and serious, for example, are different across regions. Uh, while a lot of Western games will be cute because they feature a cat, adorable, I will not contest that. Uh, the tolerances of cute are a lot different. You'll see games about mass murder happening within Asian spheres uh, with very cute chibi art. Regional influences also affects the games being made. If we look a little bit about things, uh, Japan is still the largest board game player in this region. 
And this also influences countries close by. We get a lot of worthy TCGs, especially in mainland China, influenced by the Japanese tradition of worthy TCGs. A lot of anima art, a lot of cute animals, like Rilakkuma and Sanrio style. Once again, because of the influence from the largest player, at least in the region. But finally, some of the style is also due to the fact that artists are making do. The top picture over here is by an artist called Roxy Dai from Hong Kong. And if I go back all the way over here, these two are also by Roxy Dai. Uh, the thing is that all of these games are made by different companies. She's just the closest thing to a board game designer that there is in Hong Kong. And finally, I'll end with this part a little bit over here. Uh, production is also heavily influencing over here. We see small games being made much more often because of portability and storage concerns, uh, especially in Hong Kong with small housing. However, because there's an association between small games and being better fit for socialization. Similarly, uh, another reason that small games are being made is because they are cheaper to make. There's less economic risk in making them, especially because at least something I found consistent throughout most of the region and most of the designers I've talked to, breaking into the global sphere is still a little bit hard, whether it is because going to conventions to sell their product is expensive. There's partially a little bit of bias that the games being made in Asia are too light for Western markets. And also because they're not sure how to break through. Since the communities are split, they're not sure how to go from one way to the other. I will end over here. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much to Jonathan. Um, so our next paper is the work of a team. And so I wanted to credit the full team before we get started. Um, the paper is called Overcoming the Biases of History, Digitally Reconstructing the Ancient Board Game uh, Liobo. And we'll see how I did on pronouncing that in just a moment. Um, so the team behind this paper consists of Jonathan Walton, Lachlan Belford, Tina Lian, Chiawei Liu, Yi Cheng Liu, Yilin Wang and Yangzi Ye. And uh, presenting on behalf of that team today is going to be Lachlan, Tina, and Yi Ching. Um, so I will pass the mic over to the team and thank you guys so much. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, let me share. Oh, well, just closed it. Oh, that was bad. Um, Uh, all right. Sorry about that. While you're pulling that up, I did also want to note that uh, you all posted a link in the panel two channel of the Discord to the game that you're going to be speaking about. So uh, folks can check that out after the panel is over. Thank you. So hello, everyone. This is the Lubo Lab team, and we are a student project team from Carnegie Mellon University Entertainment Technology Center. Um, so this is our team, and our instructor is Johnson Walton. This is a short outline of our presentation. We will be explaining the research we've done for Liu Bo, the iteration process of the development of the version we made, the strategy we observed after watching many playtests, as well as the biases of history. So what is Liu Bo? Liu Bo is an ancient Chinese board game that consists of pieces, sticks, dice, and board. It is a strategy game that's also used for divination and gambling, and was popular around 500 BCE to 500 CE. There were many sculptures and Liu Bo pieces found in ancient Chinese tombs, such as the ones shown in the picture, but the actual rules of the game have been lost. So this is a short demo of the a little ball we made. The theme of the game is about bird catching fish, and the player needs six points to win the game. Players start by rolling sticks, which is like rolling dice. The sticks will generate two random numbers, each representing the number of steps a piece can move. The player needs to move two pieces with corresponding step numbers. And there were multiple ways to score points, such as capturing and dropping off fish, and the mechanisms of blockade and capture will explain in detail shortly.
We conducted extensive research, drove deep into the history of the time period, and studied ancient Chinese manuscripts and artifacts to piece together the rules of the game. We iterated on the gameplay mechanisms, including piece movement, scoring, capturing, and blocking, in order to refine the game for optimal balance and enjoyment, while still respecting its historical context. So to design and recreate this game from research materials, we started with the theme and player goals. From an ancient book, there's a brief description of the gameplay of Liu Bo. Uh, it says, to play, two people sit across the set facing each other, and the middle is water. Each player throws four-sided sticks to move their pieces. When a piece moved to the place, it stood up to become an owl, and then it enters the water to catch fish. Catching one fish is worth two chips, and th stealing one chip is worth three chips. If one caught two fish but didn't win, that means they had two fish stolen. The enemy got six chips, which is a great victory. This description leads to our core gameplay mechanisms. First, the center of the board represents water. Second, the player turns the bird pieces into owl for catching fish. Finally, the owls indicate standing the, the piece upright. Throughout the iteration, we keep sticking to those features and build all other rules on top of it. We can see these mechanisms preserved completely in our final product. When a bird reaches the central pond, it stands up to become an owl. When an owl reaches the nest, it lies down again, which means it drops the fish and the player score points. Now, the next question is, what positions do the pieces stand on, and what roads do they move along exactly? According to the Asian books, there are nine types of positions related to the board, but their meaning on the board are unclear. Here, for convenience, I will just use A to I to refer to them, but researchers have concluded with a system to map the nine names to the lines and circles on the board. For example, this line in the corner is believed to be A, this one is B, then C, D, E, F, G, H, and the center of the square is I. The other three corners are the same, with three additional A's and B's, and so on until H. Now, here's another quote from an Asian book that provides a formula for playing Liu Bo, which I have replaced with A to I for each of reference. According to this formula, we believe that position A to I connected with each other to form a path. Connecting all four sets of A to I, we got a diagram of, of a path with four branches connecting the corners to the center. We play tested this pattern of path in the game where the pieces move from the end of branches to the center. And we found the problem was that sometimes it was difficult for the two sides to encounter each other. And when they do encounter, they often block each other, making it too easy to either defend, attack, or even cause a deadlock. deadlock. To solve this issue, we drew inspiration from the contemporary game Pachisi and connect the branches to form loops. So when the two sides confront, it's easier to escape, reinforce, or attack with a siege. This greatly increased our diversity of the strategy. However, during play tests, we found the position and path were too hard to remember as it's unlike any game people are familiar with. So we translated the knight's position into English and marked them on the board, which helped player understand the functions of specific positions. We also added a layer showing the connection between the spaces to help players plan for their target ahead of time. Uh, by far, the biggest challenge of this project, sort of the central challenge, is that all of the mechanics of the game have been lost to time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, at the end about the biases of history that we believe led to this happening. But for right now, I want to talk about how we use this limitation and got around this limitation to design our mechanics and create a complete and engaging experience. And so I'll be using our capturing system, blocking system, and random number generation as examples. Um, for all of these, we started with what historical descriptions do still exist. The rules are lost, but the game is frequently mentioned in historical texts, often 
being used as a metaphor and somebody of advising their king, you should act like this, just like the players do in Leobois. And we'll see an example of that. That guided us to the main mechanics, but there were still a lot of gaps. That's when we started looking at other ancient games, such as Parcheesi, which we honed in on as a likely inspiration, although we don't know that for sure, but it's from a similar uh, geographical region and similar time period. And, and we found that it, there was a lot of similarities to draw from. Um, but finally, it was really important that we created, recreated the components that we know were part of this game and then observed their properties. We looked at them all and asked, why are they shaped this way? And what interesting gameplay might that lead to? So we combined our observations and ideas from all these sources into a number of rounds of paper play tests with naive players. Um, and we iterated from those observations into our final version, our digital version. Um, so for example, we would start with a quote like this, this idea that in Leobois, you should eat if it's safe, stop if it's not safe. This became the basis of a capturing system. We, you know, the word capture was not used in any of our texts, so we believe this referred to pieces eating each other, but we still didn't know what this should look like exactly. At first, we had a system where any piece could capture any opponent's piece just by landing on it exactly. But this led to games that were way too fast and way too swingy, just very random. Um, and so we needed a new solution. It was around this time that we created a much more robust paper prototype. At first, we had been using just these paper slips as pieces, but now we made more authentic block pieces. And that allowed us to realize, oh, these pieces stack on top of each other so nicely. And while stacking was also not directly referenced, this seemed like such a natural use for them that we wanted to find a, a use in our version of the game for this. Uh, this inspired us to change our capturing system to require two pieces of one color to capture one of the other, um, which leads to this in-between state, this contested state in which two opposing pieces are stacked on top of each other, waiting for a third piece to complete the capture. Um, this created a reason to use stacking and also slowed down the capturing to a much more tactical rate that our playtesters really enjoyed. But this also introduced a new interesting question. If opposing pieces can stack, then surely friendly pieces can stack on each other, but we didn't know what this should mean. Um, but we had this vague idea from our research that the, the friendly pieces need to support each other in some way, especially the owl piece needs to be kept safe uh, by your other pieces supporting it. But we didn't have a direct way for this to happen yet. So this is when we looked at Parcheesi and asked, what does it mean when pieces stack in this game? And of course, in this traditional version, when the pieces nest on top of each other, they create a blockade that prevents all other pieces from moving through them. So we tried essentially um, just porting this directly into our game just to see how it worked. And we found that it was a natural fit. Um, this created a reason for friendly pieces to stack. And now there were multiple strategies in our game. Some people were offensive and focused on capturing. Others really loved playing defensively and made a lot of blockades. Um, and finally, somewhere the history was contradictory or confusing is that over the thousand years of this game, there were several methods used um, to roll random numbers for the game. Uh, we wanted to focus in on just one, but we tried them all out to see which created the best mix of randomness and strategy, which we knew was something the game was really known for in its time. Um, so we tried them all out with prototypes and we found that the two-sided throwing sticks were the clear winner um, because I'm going to skip through this part a little bit just for time, but they're essentially coins, heads and tails. Heads are worth one, so you can roll one, two, three, or all tails is four. Uh, the important part of this is that rolls of one and two are now much more common than rolls of three and four, uh, creating these exciting or frustrating moments when either you or your opponent roll big. It makes it rarer and more impactful. Um, in addition, we found sort of as a bonus that our playtesters really loved the feel of rolling these sticks in our physical version. And so we, we tried really hard to preserve this as much as we could in our digital version. So I will talk, show some strategies that players were using during the playtest. The first one is to set the trap. Our tournament champion used this strategy to capture the opponent's house instead of scoring the nest. He used his normal pieces to set around the pound and wait for the opponent's house to get, up, get out of the pound. And the second strategy is to build a bridge before you move your house out of the pound. As you can see, player used 
players use normal pieces to set a pass for the outs to move on the top of the normal pieces step by step, and each step will become a blockade, which is safe enough for the outs to get out, uh, get to the nest. So using normal pieces to protect your outs is another strategy that we found. And so finally, I want to talk a little bit about why we think the game was lost and some surprising biases we ran into in the process of reconstructing it that made it more difficult than we anticipated. Um, this has to do with the biases of historians, uh, both the ancient historians and modern day historians. Also, the bias of what does or does not survive the passage of time for us to study. Um, so, for instance, uh, Han Dynasty commentators and historians really did not think very highly of Liu Bua. Uh, it was a very popular game, but considered relatively unimportant. It, its randomness made it seem unrefined. It was also a little bit of a vice used as a common gambling game. And those are the exact things that made it popular, but it also made the people who wrote the history much more inclined to write about something they considered more refined, like Go. And so less overall was written about the game. Um, similarly, modern historians have been studying the game in some form for about 100 years, um, but they have really overemphasized the game's use in fortune telling over studying the game as an actual game. And while this was also an important use of the game and its components in society, um, a recent survey of all the existing documents and historical sources have shown that it is mentioned much more frequently as just a game, quote unquote, than it is in fortune telling, yet our modern focus on it has been pretty much the inverse of that. And so it's gone really understudied uh, until recently. Um, also, the only surviving physical evidence are these really lavish game sets from the tomb of wealthy individuals. Um, and while these are great to study and provided excellent art resources for our project, um, it means that we don't really have any idea what a common game of Leobo would have looked like. We know it was played far and wide, but we don't really know what that looked like. Um, and then finally, there's some modern bias we ran into in, in creating it. Um, a number of the game designers we play tested with were of the mind that ancient games are just not that good, um, that they are unbalanced, they didn't know enough about game design back then, uh, they were sort of repetitive, and they're not really worth preserving. And we definitely disagreed with that, but this is a, a viewpoint we ran into repeatedly. We also had a lot of trouble teaching players that the pieces stand on the lines and not the spaces, which is very unfamiliar to a modern audience. And some people were biased by previous failed attempts to reconstruct this game that either were not based on research or were stymied by that need to be 100% accurate and that inability due to the lack of sources, which led to a very conscious decision at the beginning of our project to focus on a fun, complete experience that respects the history while knowing we can't be 100% historically accurate. Um, so that was our project, Reconstructing Leo Ball. Thank you so much for listening, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, our next presenter is Harlan Steele, who also goes by Haley. And the paper that they will be presenting is called Imperial Gender Bias and Play. And actually, as I'm looking, I think maybe they got dropped from the panelists. So let me see if I can add them again. I don't, I don't see them here. I just added them back in. Okay, I think when, maybe okay. they disconnected. <laughs> All right, so, sorry about that. Uh, the minute I tried to use the computer, it started shutting down. So I'm on a, a computer in my lab. So apologies. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, I am just going to share my screen. Hopefully I can still do that. Let's, let's see, can everyone see the slideshow? Okay. Um, uh, okay, and I, I can't see anyone else now. So if someone could turn your mic off and just say, I can see the slideshow, that would be super helpful. We can see it. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, all right, so 
the name the name of this presentation is Imperial Gender Bias in Play, and uh, well, okay, so so how I define gender, I want to launch into this real quick. So <clears throat> I treat gender paradigms as co-created nonfiction diegeses that are experienced through an actionist subjectivity and can be re reified through social apparatuses that can be polarized towards consent or coercion. And I am drawing on a bunch of scholars to kind of Frankenstein that together, including, including a LARP scholar. So gender paradigms is something I'm gonna be thinking about a lot in the next 15 minutes. Um, paradigm. This is a concept I'm drawing from Thomas Kuhn's 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, in Kuhn's work, we see this concept of a model crisis in which uh, a model is found to not quite fit uh, observed reality. So you have this process through which a paradigm shift begins to occur after a model re uh, uh, revolution. And, uh, and you, you find yourself with, with new models and new paradigms emerging, the new paradigm being incommensurate with the old one, meaning they, they can't really uh, work within each other. They're just two modes of thinking about, thinking about the world or the universe or whatever the model intends to represent. The common example for this is uh, Newton versus Einstein, you know, the Newtonian physics versus Einsteinian physics. That's what... Uh, Kuhn uses to illustrate this idea of a paradigm shift. Okay, wait, wait, okay. So I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm getting ahead of myself. My name, my names, my names are Harlan Haley Steele. I go by they, she, z, or he. I am gender fluid, gender queer. I love it when people switch between my names and pronouns. It's not required, but yeah, it kind of, it, it, it really helps. It's wonderful if, if, folks, if folks can do that. Um, I go by all of these pronouns. I am a PhD candidate in cultural studies at UC Davis, and my designated emphases are actually in performance and science and technology studies. I also have an MFA, and I've been teaching literature and English at Western Washington University uh, for the last year. So um, some trivia about me. I have been a LARP practitioner since 2002. I am a co-op nerd. I love worker co-ops. And my dissertation advisor is a literal clown, L.M. Bogad, founded Circa, the Clown Army. And he wrote this, this book, Performing Truth, Works of Radical Memory uh, for Times of Social Amnesia, asking us how might we use the tools of theater to help keep audiences engaged in the things that matter, matter most in these times. So I'm going to be pulling a page from my dissertation advisor's book and engaging performativity and performance a little bit more than usual in this talk. So I had this comedy routine I was gonna do in the beginning, but I gotta cut that for the sake of time. It got too long. There was some uh, com comparison between uh, imperial gender binary and nuclear, nuclear proliferation. I'm gonna put the slides in the, in the chat after this. So if you wanna see that, that's, that's what's there. But we're, we're actually gonna hop right into the queer joy frame, the queer joy part of this talk. And if you wanna know why we need queer joy, you can, you can read the slide later, but we need queer joy, it is important. And yeah, okay, we need queer joy. So in the, say, in the, in the name of queer joy, this section of the talk is called, Oh, the Genders You'll Know, a non-exhaustive non tour. So, Traditional non-dyadic ways of knowing gender exist around the world and can be found in every era of history and in archeological records. Burgess Society in Indonesia has five genders. They recognize, they recognize five genders outside of, well, Mushe gender in Oaxaca Valley, Mexico. Uh, also uh, a unique gender, cultural gender specific to that region. The Hedra gender of old India, another of among many genders that can be found in the region. Isangoma gender in Zulu culture actually has a gender identity that shifts depending on the ancestor the person is working with. So they're, they often serve a role as healers, a social role in that society. So genders that defy 
the imperial binary have been around since time immemorial. We have this textbook kind of at the bottom of this slide, Gender and the Archaeology of Death that explores gender anomalies in burial sites from around the world. There have been uh, uh, archaeological sites where people have been found buried in ways that don't match how the archaeologists think their gender identity should be. And that's more on the archaeologists than on the society. And so there's a lot of conversation about that happening in archaeology right now. Uh, the Bernesha gender in Albania, it's another cultural, culturally specific gender. Feminelli gender in Italy can be traced back to millennia. This is a gender associated with luck. Two spirit on Turtle Island or North America. So uh, and Turtle Island is an indigenous term used to refer to North America. And 2SQ, two spirit, refers to indigenous people of a variety of genders outside of the imperial binary. And two spirit activists like Joshua Whitehead and Michelle Cameron have pushed back against settler attempts at gender appropriation. So uh, let's listen to Michelle Cameron for a sec. Uh, while I'm gonna just read her quote, the, tomb, the term two spirited has a specific cultural context and removing it from that context simply because one likes the meaning of it is an act of colonization and must be resisted. Likewise, Joshua Whitehead, an OG Cree two-spirit activist and poet, says the appropriation of two-spirit genealogies by settler queerness to market as a reminder uh, of, of Western conceptions of queerness have always lived due in part to the stealing of third, fourth, fifth, and fluid genders from many, although not all, indigenous worldviews. So here's where we switch from the queer joy frame to the queer rage frame. The first pride was a riot, gender theft on Turtle Island. Early settlers on Turtle Island documented over 80 tribal nations with genders unknown to them. Many indigenous groups were later forced to give up their traditional genders as part of negotiations with the US government or risk further land loss and harm. Likewise, in India, prior to the colonization by the British Empire, at least 20 distinct genders were recognized in old India. These genders were pushed underground and criminalized under British imperial rule, which is why it is so exciting that Hydra have gained legal recognition roughly a decade ago. There are many more genders that still need legal recognition in India. So calling it the third gender is a misnomer. So. In fact, all of the genders that we just looked at have had to endure attempts at colonial erasure. And it can actually be a further form of violence for people outside of those cultures to claim those genders as theirs. So some might ask, if all these genders aren't for me, why bother learning about them? Let's look at an example. So this is from the poetry world. In 2018, a two-spirit poet, Joshua Whitehead, was nominated for a Lambda Award in the category of trans poetry. But he had to turn the nomination down because he is two-spirited, he's not trans. So he wrote an impassioned open letter to the award organization, organization and I hope everyone reads it. I had my students read it. It's incredible prose where he eloquently explains that he could not accept this nomination because there's no category for two-spirit people in the Lambda Awards. Um, and it would have been harmful to trans people for him to claim an award set aside for them when he is not trans. So, so by affirming the uniqueness of genders outside of our own without trying to appropriate them, we can better ensure that these genders have proper representation and self-determination in the spaces we have power over. Getting back to this, getting back to this though, why does empire seem to have such a hard time with genders beyond two? Spoiler alert, gendered empire, this, this is a thing. So let's, let's switch frames. We're going into a how-to book frame. So we've got our our how-to book, Empire Building for Dummies. So you wanna build an empire, you've gotta implement binary gender and private property. You can do it like a pro with this how-to book that comes to us from, from ancient Samaria. So uh, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna actually skip. But if you if you want to read some step by step approaches from this book, the uh, the slides will be available. But uh, if you really want to build an empire, you must divide your populace at a level that reaches into the family that erodes the basis for equitable kinship within people's very households. This helps erode pockets of resistance that might form to your empire's reign. And the absolute best way to do this is to implement coercive systems of asymmetrical binary gender. So got some guides here on how to do that. Let's hop over to Sandy Stone, whose work the Empire Strikes Back, a post-transsexual manifesto is considered the seminal text for transgender studies. Sandy Stone wrote, I suggest constituting transsexuals not as a class or problematic third gender, but rather as a genre, as a set of embodied texts. So drawing upon Stone's thinking, we might think of different genders as different genres. And in that case, for our empire building project, if you're building an empire, it is vital you limit the genres of gender, gender your populace can imagine themselves into to two. And looking back at the earliest known imperial work of literature, we have the Epic of Gilgamesh, earliest known work of binary gender propaganda. Um, divides all characters into one of two genders. And one gender is almost exclusively portrayed as being in service to the other. And this is in spite of the diversity of genders around them. It's quite wild. And within 50 to 100 years, within the same empire, same region of Epic of Gilgamesh, we got the code of ur -Nimu, oldest known imperial legal code, rolled out uh, to enforce punishments, to use violence to back up that system of gender. So we got our rule book setting, we have our mechanics, only it's not a game because it's backed up by violence. And every Western empire that came after this has continued to draw upon this binary framework of asymmetrical gender for controlling its populace. It is handy if you want to build an empire. Empire from its earliest recorded inception has always been concerned with turning this into this because gender diversity is a threat to empire. But empire is a threat to the planet. Post-capitalist philosopher Bernard Stiegler uses the concept of entropy to discuss uh, processes that destroy difference, uh, social processes. He argues that systemic destruction of social difference is interconnected with ecocide. Stiegler offers negentropy as approach, as a tactical approach to resisting systems that destroy difference. He suggests working to nourish the proliferation of localized difference. So using, using his approach to talk about gender, we might ask, how are localized and cultural genders negentropic? Could negentropic gender be a way of resisting empire? Could it be that the revitalization of negentropic genders help us resist ecocide? What might it mean to revive regional genders and to have more hyperlocal genders that aren't easily legible to those outside of local communities? In his 2023 book, Aaron Trammell um, writes in Repairing Play, A Black Phenomenology, that when consent can't be achieved, play isn't possible, at least for those who have systematically been denied the ability to consent. I should say that's a summary. Um, while this work specifically focus up, focuses upon anti-Blackness in play, we might consider this wisdom in approaching imperial gender bias when it emerges in spaces of play. And now we are switching to a space opera frame. We've got our Gramsci, the old world is dying, the new world struggles to be born, gender paradigms. We are in a time of liminality when it comes to gender and gendered relations. On the one hand, a global empire that has dealt in non-consensual forms of gendering has reached a point of decay, its overreach having undeniably damaged the planet. While on the other hand, like dandelions sprouting up through cracks in the pavement, we find 
the reemergence of new and pre-colonial ways of experiencing and co-creating gender. So I'm, I'm gonna summarize, but uh, this is the story time part where I dip into a tiny bit of autoethnography, talking about how two decades ago in 2002, while living on Duwamish and Snoqualmie land, known as the Seattle suburbs, I was part of a cosplay group. We came up with a LARP structure that was quite fluid, that was quite fluid. And we, we began co-creating ways of expressing gender within this LARP somewhat accidentally. As teenagers in the colonial North American suburbs, just coming out of the 90s, we didn't have the terms trans, asexual, or gender fluid. But those of us who later came to identify with some of these terms found ways to hack the structure of the game so we could role play in a way that honored who we were. As someone who eventually found the terms gender fluid, gender queer, and gender full as labels that helped me make sense of myself, I played the game in a certain kind of way. I played many characters. I switched frames constantly. This fluid regional style of LARP, which Dr. Susan Weiner and I have been calling Cascadian Collectivist LARP, allowed me to rapidly switch between genders. And for the first time, thanks to this LARP structure, I was able to bring my authentic self into the presence of other people for the first time. Having non-dyadic genders sprout up accidentally while playing analog RPGs is not an uncommon occurrence. Likewise, a growing movement of analog RPG creators resist imperial gender bias and create games that include and represent a diversity of genders and ways of knowing gender. Looking at the work of Edmund Y. Chang, who coined the term queer gaming, we are offered queer gaming as a provocation, a call to games, a horizon of possibilities. We are indeed in the midst of a paradigm shift when it comes to gender, a shift that has arrived in analog gaming. Education and educating yourself is the first step to resisting imperial gender bias in the games you make, run, and play. So to offer a quick summary, genders beyond the dyad can be found on every continent in every period of history. Different cultures have different ways of knowing and recognizing genders. By affirming the uniqueness of genders outside of our own without trying to appropriate them, we can better ensure these genders have power, representation, self-determination uh, over the spaces we have power over. Supporting gender diversity is a potent way of resisting empire and might even save the planet also, there's a growing movement of analog RPG makers and queer gaming scholars who are already working to resist imperial gender bias with their games and scholarship. I've got some further reading here that I, I highly recommend. Um, and I would love to hear your notes, feedback. This talk is a work in progress. I might turn it into a performance thing. So we'll see what happens. But thank you all so, so much. It's an honor to be here. And um, I look forward to, to any and all questions. Feel free to reach out by email. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. OK, so our final presenter is Cody uh, Walliser. And his presentation is titled, That Swamp is a Mountain, Fair Play and Cultural Expression in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. So take it away, Cody, bring us home. Awesome, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I hope everyone can hear me as well. I'm just going to assume that you can since it seems like on my end, everything's working well. Um, so I'm gonna hop right in. I figured it would be fun since we're at a game studies conference to play a game while we are working through my presentation. So throughout this presentation, you're gonna see some numbered pictures pop up on gray backgrounds. Um, these pictures are official art on Magic the Gathering cards. So what I want y'all to do either in the Discord or the chat, just somewhere, uh, do your best to guess what color each card is based on its art. And in case you didn't know, it's really simple. There are five colors in Magic the Gathering. So white, blue, black, red, or green are your options. So again, you'll see some images come across and I'm gonna ask you white, blue, black, red, or green. Just answer based on the art that you see in front of you. And we'll start with a quick example here. So this is our first card, number one. 
card number one, white, blue, black, red, or green? Card number one, white, blue, black, red, or green? <laughs> I see the Discord going a little bit wild there. That's awesome to see. Let's keep that up as we go along. All right, cool. My presentation is called uh, That Swamp is a Mountain. My name is Dr. Cody Walliser, um, and I am so excited to be back at Generation Analog. I want to briefly acknowledge the land that I am on, which is known as Denver, Colorado, is primarily Cheyenne and Arapaho land. And now that I've acknowledged that, I want to acknowledge that that acknowledgement is not enough. And I want to say that it probably didn't uh, give back the land to its rightful owners. So as people who consider ourselves, you know, allies, if we do, we ought to consider uh, what the political ends of that acknowledgement is. And let's let's work towards repealing things like Johnson v. McIntosh, for instance, to be very specific. Let's work towards getting the land back as opposed to just acknowledging that it's not in its rightful owner's hands. All right. Um, so going on, I, I thought it would be useful to organize my presentation just by asking some simple questions. So what is blank is sort of my uh, table of contents, so to speak. And we basically have to answer four questions in order to get the full gist of my presentation. And so uh, the first question here is what is Ludo Orientalism? The second question is what is Kamigawa? The third question is what is the Red Lantern Swamp? And then the final question is, what is my argument? What am I trying to do with all of this? So let's go ahead and jump in uh, to what is Ludo Orientalism first and foremost. Um, Ludo Orientalism is essentially two ideas put together. And so I want to just make sure that we have both the origin and understanding of those ideas as down as we possibly mm. can. So if the, the first thing that we mm. need to know is Orientalism. What is Orientalism? Um, I'm going to say that this term, although, uh, you know, it was somewhat used before that, that it was really coined by Edward Said's book of the same name, and that its root is in the binary, so to speak, the historical development of a binary between East and West, typically, and this is where the meaning comes in, right, typically perpetuated by Western historians, artists, and so on, who are creating representations of the East such that the Western subject maintains its hegemony. So this included things like basically saying that the East has no history, that uh, people from the quote unquote Orient are savages and uncivilized and so on. So then adding the ludic element into that is Tara Fickle and uh, her book, The Race Card. This is one of the most important works in game studies as far as I'm concerned. So I would encourage everyone to read it uh, or check it out. Uh, no affiliation or advertisement included, by the way. Um, and I would just say that the, the root here, the idea of it is to add the ludic element, the play, the games, the playfulness into the concept of Orientalism, because consistently games are thought of as neutral spaces. There's this idea of the magic circle and so on. And the argument instead to put Ludo Orientalism together is to say that games and the practices around them have have historically contributed to harmful discourses of racialization and nation building specifically with the respect to the broader ideology that I talked about before, which is East and West or East versus West. So that's what Ludo Orientalism is. We answer our first question. Let's keep playing our game. Maybe people recognize this character from a Dungeons and Dragons uh, property that came out recently, but I'm wondering if uh, you all think this is white, blue, black, red, or green. White, blue, black, red, or green on this one. I think somebody may have asked in the Discord, I'm trying to keep track, like, what if I know what the card is? All right, well, then try not to spoil it for other people. Um, you know, I'm hoping that eventually the, the aha moment becomes clear. Okay. What is Kamigawa then? I have to be very careful not to enter story time because I could talk about uh, Kamigawa for forever. Um, you know, I, I think that this is probably, as a Japanese American, the most complex media text that exists out there for me to understand in relation to myself. So uh, kind of difficult to, to summarize really quickly, but I'll just say that Kamigawa in context means, or understanding Kamigawa in context means we have to understand that magic is a multiverse. So it's consisting of all these different places they're called planes, just like they are in Dungeons and Dragons, that are kind of segregated off to themselves. Now, recent story events would say, no, they're not segregated.
get any more, let's bracket that for a second and just understand how the broader history of magic has developed. And so we can understand Kamigawa then as the Japanese plane. This is where, you know, all of the Japanese elements of fantasy that you would probably think of and see in other games um, are present and they're kind of quartered off into this own place. So if you have, you know, any of these themes like ninja and samurai, if you have anything like Shinto or Japanese uh, Buddhism, like Zen Buddhism, for instance, or even if you have a traditional tension within Japanese culture being represented in magic, it is likely that it is being represented through the artwork or through the storytelling of Kamigawa. And so that place is particularly important to explain a um, little bit more about. This is a map of Kamigawa. And as you can see, it has some very typical or stereotypical uh, Japanese elements associated with it. There's sort of the origami cities, the uh, very clear, you know, Gundam hanging off of the castle over here. You've got like a sort of bonsai-esque tree as sort of the tree of life in the middle and so on. Um, and just in general, thinking about what this plane is, is it is the place for Japanese cultural expression within Magic the Gathering. So situating that contextually will be important as we go through the next portions of my presentation. All right, we're on the third card. This one is from Kamigawa. And I am wondering if you think this card is white, blue, black, red, or green. White, blue, black, red, or green on this card. All right, next we need to answer what is the Red Lantern Swamp? So we returned to Kamigawa, which was originally printed in the early 2000s in 2022 with Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, the uh, sort of uh, product that I was just showing on the last page. And the Red Lantern Swamp is a part of that set. So this is it, dun, dun, dun. This is the, uh, the, the evil figure of my story, so to speak, uh, because this innocent looking thing, at least to me, became what is basically known as the most controversial card from this set. And so we have to understand that again in context, um, you know, in comparison to all these lands that are along with it, this is a part of what's called a cycle. So a set of cards that exist in one or more colors that does, uh, you know, essentially the same thing or has the same quality. In this case, they are all full art lands. There are two of each of them. And you can see where the Red Lantern Swamp kind of fits in, in reference to all of these other uh, pieces of art that also show clearly these very, uh, you know, touchstone icons of Japanese culture. So you have the Tori gates and the rice patties in this plains over here on the left. You have the origami birds, uh, you know, and some sort of pagoda-like structures in the clouds over on the right. Uh, you've got obviously the Red Lantern Swamp and the other swamp, which both show these very clearly Japanese scenes of, you know, the bamboo over the, the moonlit uh, pond or lake there. And then, you know, a very clear reference to Mount Fuji and so on. I agree. Those are some very gorgeous cards. So then what is controversial about them? Well, the idea was that the Red Lantern Swamp here, simply because it is red, simply because it has this Red Lantern on it, looks too much like a mountain. And so that's where the title of my paper comes from. And where is this controversy primarily taking place? Well, it's not just, you know, in the dark corners of the internet. One of the most popular Magic the Gathering podcasts named this card, the Red Lantern Swamp, the most controversial card from the set. Additionally, prominent threads on Reddit, including the reveal thread for this particular card, called to the idea that this card would be potentially unfair. So the controversy around this is that it looks too much like a mountain. The presence of the Red Lantern Lantern itself means that it does not work well as a game piece and it creates bad gameplay experiences uh, where cheating could possibly be a part of the conversation or at least trying to get one over on somebody by using something that's, yes, a part of the rules, but frowned upon. So how do we deal with that? Well, first, we've got to finish playing our game. So Let's get through the fourth card here. This is uh, one of uh, my favorite pieces of Magic the Gathering art. Really compelling, I think. And I'm wondering if you think this is white, blue, black, red, or green. And then we'll have to get into the question of what is my argument. So in order to foreground this, I'm a communication scholar. I come at game studies from a rhetorical standpoint. So ultimately what I'm doing is racial rhetorical criticism. And what that means for me is that the study of this game, right, the study of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, is the study of the real and symbolic 
all at once hyphenated term, real and abstract, real and symbolic significance of race, especially with regard to communicative practices like the way that we talk about the game pieces that we're playing with. So here we're talking about the practices of play and how talking about the game of magic constitutes both the game and the players. So as we move on, we need to finish our game, as I said, so I can really make my point of my argument, I can really get into racial rhetorical criticism. So this is the last card, white, blue, black, red, or green. Now you'll notice there's five colors of magic. There were five cards. I promise I am not trying to trick you. I just want to know what you think if this one is white, blue, black, red, or green. And the reason I ask is because all of these cards are black. Uh, now, you might say, were there controversies about these cards? Uh, you know, no. <laughs> and even in the case that you might look at one of these cards and say, well, that looks kind of like a red card, or that's very blue, or that's very green, or, you know, this could possibly be a white card, depending on how you're interpreting that kind of glittering uh, presentation that's going on here and what you might know about the mana colors of Magic the Gathering or not. Um, but you can see that all of these cards depart from the typical aesthetic that a black card has, yet these cards did not create controversy. So my argument is not just about the difference, telling the difference between lands, right? Because that is a small portion of this. It's actually about one step further than that. It's about saying, okay, telling the difference between lands depends on a difference between lands. These two things are actually the exact same game piece, right? This swamp right here and this swamp right here are the exact same game piece. They work the exact same way. If Magic the Gathering wanted to, they could be like Pokemon trading card game is, where energy cards are all exactly the same. They look exactly the same. They basically just have this symbol here. So the only difference between these cards is cultural expression. The only difference between this swamp or any other one is how it looks. And that creates two key pieces of my argument. Because first of all, the only content to analyze is the cultural expression itself. The difference between this swamp and another one is simply the art and how it looks, right? The second part is really important piece of that though, which is that these things actually create different levels of economic demand based on how much people like the game piece. So there's this tension happening within this Ludo Orientalist discourse. On the one hand, these are some of the most expensive basic lands out there, right? As many people in the Discord said, those are beautiful cards. But on the other hand, they're potentially unfair. So there's this tension where they are once being sort of fetishized by the market, right? They, are, they cost an exorbitant amount more than even other lands from the same set because the cultural expression itself, that image is so valuable. But on the other hand, they are potentially unfair or undesirable because they are not conforming to a Western standard of fairness with within the gameplay experience. And I think that that's particularly important when we think about limited and limited resources, which is a style of the game that only plays with one set. So essentially what limited resources did is they came to Japan and they said, there's too much Red Lantern here. And I think that that is extremely problematic, but it also exemplifies a larger discourse about cultural expression and fairness within Magic the Gathering. These are three different sets of cards, one from 2019, the Planeswalkers in War of the Spark, one from Strixhaven, the Japanese Mystical Archive in 2021. Uh, War of the Spark was 2019, by the way. And then this card is coming out in September as a promo for the 30th anniversary of Magic in Japan. Uh, all three of these cards have also been described as unfair or any of their counterparts, right, in the case of the first two have been described as unfair, both because of their play experience and their accessibility to the economy. So these are clearly uh, vestiges of this larger Ludo-Orientalist discourse with both racializes and creates a nation-building discourse by creating fair play conditions both in the game and outside of the game. So really, my piece is making conclusions about three things. First, I'm arguing that games such as Magic the Gathering, uh, in an extension of this argument from Tara Fickle's book, 
they are a part of, not apart from these larger discourses of racialization and nation building. And then I am very specific about making conclusions about the Red Lantern Swamp itself, what the meaning of the Chochin, the actual Red Lantern Swamp is. It's a welcoming sign for visitors and so on, and how all that gets tied up into a conversation about fair play. And then, of course, I am extending that and making sure, really checking my argument, so to speak, that it's not just this one thing, that this isn't a one-off experience, that there is a, a clear pattern of ludo orientalist discourse when it comes to framing Japanese cultural expression in Magic the Gathering. And I just want to say I'm really appreciative to be on this panel. Uh, it is so awesome to see the research that folks are doing, and I, I can't wait to jump into a conversation um, and answer some questions. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed. All right. Thank you so much to all four of our panelists. Uh, or our, all four of our paper presenters. I know some, there was more than four. So uh, I am looking in the Q&A right now. So if you have questions for any of our presenters, please uh, type them in there. And we have a couple that are queued up and ready to go. So I'm gonna start with a question that is for Cody. Um, so Arnaldo asks you, Cody, do you think people from different parts of the world will see those cards at the same way in terms of hidden or subliminal messages? I don't. Um, I, I, of course, think that there's going to be a lot of variation and that, you know, any process of communication of, uh, about these things is going to be non-linear or difficult to track. Um, but what I would say specifically is kind of two things that I left out there, just following some of the conversation in the, in the discord here, uh, especially about interpretation about these cards. One is that foreign language cards are a part of the rules. They're they are in the rules of magic. So I want to make that super clear that they are legal, right? So saying that these things is unfair, it, it's probably akin to a more, you know, cheesing or using something that's a part of the game in a way that's not intended as opposed to cheating. I want to make that super clear because uh, it seemed like there was a question about that. And so I think interpretation, if any judge was to see these cards, they would just say they're a legal card. You know, this is what it means if somebody doesn't know. They're available to uh, be played just like any other card, especially if it's your native language, which, I mean, obviously should be an expectation of a fair play environment. The second thing that I would say about how other people are going to interpret this is that, yes, the only difference is the image. The only difference is the cultural expression. And so that's often how people are using them and how people want them to be interpreted, right? So when I play these cards, I actually play them. I could grab some. They're like right behind me. Uh, when I play them, I am doing so because I am saying something about myself. And I think that is a really beautiful and intended thing. I also think it's a, a way that... Wizards is marketing some of these products to people. So uh, that's how I would answer that question. I hope I, I didn't take too long. Oh, that was perfect. Um, we also have a question in the Q&A from Hanju, and this is a question for the team behind the Luobo reconstruction. Um, so Hanju asks, did you look at reconstruction of other historical games like the Royal Game of Ur, and how were those reconstructions similar or different to the work that your team did? Yeah, I can take that. Um, we did not look specifically at the Royal Game of Ur. Um, we did a survey of sort of other ancient games at the beginning, and we looked at Senate a little bit as inspiration for just sort of, that's what our team was familiar with in terms of ancient games. We didn't have a lot of background in it, um, but we pretty quickly narrowed in on games that were either definitely complete, like Go, and um, close in geography and in time period, although, but it, it would have been an excellent idea to, to broaden it, but we, we sort of had to limit the scope of our project to fit into the semester. But yeah, that's a great idea. Oh, uh, I have a question for Jonathan Harrington, if it's okay to hop in. Um, I can't see the chat, this computer is, I had to switch computers today. Um, yeah, I was uh, really interested in your talk, kind of uh, uh, provincializing games. And uh, I, I was intrigued when you mentioned uh, that Kickstarter has changed to now allow folks in mainland China to purchase games. And I wonder if you think this will impact regional game making, you know, will with, uh, you know, more competitors from around the world now coming in, do you think it might potentially be a problem or dilute uh, uh, game the game making culture in mainland China? Or, or do you see this as, as a boon? Um, uh, I think it's already a little bit diluted, so to speak. 
So for example, look at Hong Kong. In terms of the biggest companies right now in Hong Kong, the biggest company is called IceMix. And I've talked with them. They make games of roughly 5,000 to 10,000 print run, which is quite decent. And I told them, where are your buyers from? And it's 70, 80% from the US. And comparing this even with, I worked with a European company before called Mighty Boys, and we had a 50% US sort of number. So the companies in East Asia that want to make it big are selling to the US market. And they're entirely focused on making games that appeal to the US market, mostly Euro games, uh, but very much their market is there. The people that make smaller games or games that are more focused for local purchasers have much smaller print runs. They try using Kickstarter, but they get maybe 100, 200 backers. Uh, and instead, they focus much more on local shops and regional conventions. So I don't think it's a matter of, well, it is a matter of dilution, but ultimately, Kickstarter won't change too much because they just have access because the marketing base will still be predominantly US based. So if they're making stuff for that market, they have to keep that in mind or their project just won't do very well. All right. Um, so we also have a question in the chat that is directed towards Harlan. So Joe asks, my 10 year old daughter commented that playing D and D as a different gender was a trans expression. I thought that this was an interesting thought, but wondered if playing as another gender could risk appropriation. Hmm. You know, that, that is, the question of the day, that is a tricky question. Um, and it's something that I want to keep grappling with. And I don't feel like I have a satisfactory answer. I think you'll find different people um, who, who might say different things about that. Uh, for the most part, you know, and I might regret, <laughs> I might regret saying this later, that the, I guess the, the point that I, that I was trying to make with my talk is more, there are these traditional uh, uh, cultural genders, and we do have to be careful about them. And I'm, I'm especially protective of, of two spirit, because that's one that's experienced appropriation um, in the United States with, with people from uh, settler backgrounds kind of claiming that gender identity when it's specifically for indigenous people. And uh, there's there's a whole history behind it. Um, so I you know I'd say you know trans like the LG the the alphabet soup that's you know it, it's it's kind of a general thing like many folks who are two spirit for example both identify as two spirit and as a cultural gender within their within their tribe or within their region um, and they might also identify using terms from the LGBTQ uh, 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 alphabet. Um, so I, I'd say I would be less worried. Um, I would be less worried about, about that. Um, if, if you're focusing on the more, um, uh, the LGBTQ stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's a good question and it's still hard. And, uh, workshopping is often done in LARPs when you're playing a trans or, or gay character, um, and you're not that yourself. So I would say if there's a chance to workshop or educate yourself about the cultural history, you know, working together with other players and uh, doing work to um, doing work to educate yourself is is always important when when playing someone of a gender identity outside of your own. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, thank you. And then following up on that, we have a poster who goes by anonymous attendee who asks you, Haley, um, are there specific genres within tabletop role playing that are providing particularly interesting mechanisms for exploring and recognizing or even rejecting gender binaries? And I know that you said you had a few that was on that slide. You had said you were maybe going to be willing to share those slides with us. So. Oh, yes, actually. Um... I need to figure out, I don't have, I'm ashamed to say I don't have the um, uh, uh, extra chat, the, what do you call it? The, uh, the other thing open. The Discord. The yeah. Discord. There, I'm so sorry. Um, but I'm going to, well, huh. 
Um, I haven't figured out how to put a link in for everyone to see. I wonder if you, if if you like, um, just to, so that you can maybe, uh, do it on, on your own time. You could email it to one of the organizers and we can also post it for you, but wonderful. Yeah. I'll, I'll email it, um, immediately after this, after this talk and, uh, and whatnot. Cause yeah, the, the how to build an empire, you know, a dividing color, it's, it's all in there. So, um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for asking that. And, um, uh, yeah, I guess in terms of structures that allow, um, that allow experimentation with gender, you know, and that's, that's a topic that that I want to keep exploring. But uh, one of the conversations I've been having with other folks who've been involved in cascading collectivist LARP structures, you know, is that's a very, very fluid based on improv acting form of LARP where you can change a character or hop through time really easily and there's no set DM. So no set game runner that that makes those, those calls. And uh, myself and folks who have uh, experimented and, and were kind of part of the cosplay movement that that LARP emerged from in the late 90s and early aughts, uh, you know, there was a lot of experimentation with gender in that LARP community. And then some of us kind of moved over into D&D inspired LARPs. And suddenly we saw a lot of that shut down and we were like, oh, that's interesting, you know, but more and more the D&D style LARPs are becoming more inclusive of, uh, of forms of gender diversity, you know, so I think it depends you know, on the player base, the structure, an easily hackable structure can let folks of genders outside of the ones you'd expect modify that structure to do what they need. Um, so having, having a LARP that is free form or, or fluid can, can allow, I think, you know, more, more, you know, more of that, but uh, it, it's on a case by case basis always. And if you do have a, a leader or a GM, like having that GM or having the game runner educated about different forms of gender expression and just being ready to roll with whatever players wanna do with gender, that's a, that's a great first step and can work in almost any system, so. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, I'm swapping to the Discord now. And so uh, Ed Chang had a, kind of question slash comment for Cody. Um, so he mentioned that he's interested to think about how the rhetoric around unfairness that Asian slash Japanese players in esports often face. Um, did you have any thoughts about how that might resonate with the discussion of uh, Magic the Gathering and this kind of uh, unfairness of the cultural cards? Well, I mean, first of all, to be asked a question by Edmund Chang, like, wow, that's awesome. Uh, I know you made it. All, you made it. <laughs> that's a really cool moment for me. So I appreciate it very much. Um, the, sec the second thing I would just say, too, is that this actually is an esport. So uh, Magic the Gathering Arena is one of the most popular ways to play it, especially during the pandemic. This was the primary way. I know, for instance, that the folks at Limited Resources were engaging with and you know, playing tons and tons and tons of these games. Um, and because it has been digitized, now the volume is so much greater. So I would just say that it directly applies through Magic the Gathering Arena. But to, to broaden the scope a little bit and to think about how like these categorizations or, or characterizations of unfairness would go out into all sorts of other, um, you know, esports and things like that. I will just have to admit my own limitations in saying I don't know a ton about other esports or, or um, you know, much other than one, which is fighting games, uh, which I've paid a little bit of attention to over the course of my career. And I know particularly in uh, the street fighter community, for instance, um, which is a really big fighting uh, game and a really big fighting game community, I think there's a big tournament coming up um, maybe next weekend or something like that, like the third, um, they particularly, I know Asian players in general are sort of categorized with particular terms. And I think they are actually like particular slang terms to call people who play these fighting games really intensely. Although I'll have to admit, I don't know what, what exactly they are. Um, and that same reputation of being in that, that Tara Fickle talks about of being like the most intense competitor, but at once being like the model minority and most hard worker and having all these economic resources to attend tournaments and those types of things. I know that that dichotomy still applies. And I would, I would be really interested in seeing more of that uh, research and hearing more about it. Awesome. Thank you. 
Uh, and I think we have time for one more. So I'm back into the Q&A, uh, the Discord Q&A. Um, so Hanju has a question for Haley regarding imperial gender bias. Uh, you sometimes specified about Western empires, but did this uh, include study of non-Western empires, for example, large empires like China, uh, the Inca, et cetera? Yeah, that's, that is an excellent question. And no, no, it did not. So that that realm is is wide open um i would be i would be excited to be in conversation with folks who are studying empire building tactics in those regions um but this was largely a western uh imperial uh uh empire building tactic all right um so let me check the Discord one more time, see if there's, uh, oh, I think if I recall, I'm going to forget who had asked, but someone asked in the Discord um, if Cody, you had uh, seen, let's see if I can find it. Da, 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 da. Ah, uh, Jonas asked, Cody, have you found any similar discourse surrounding other pieces of art in magic, like the black and white basic lands from Midnight Hunt? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and the specifically because those black and white lands came out right before Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, right? So it's like a one-to-one -one comparison in terms of looking at the discourse. And I can just say, Jonas, from my perspective and from what I was able to see, especially in places that I was looking, like on Reddit or in uh, limited resources, for instance, there's either no discussion of them or people simply comment on their quality. They just say they are good or bad. They like them or they don't. But there is not really a huge discussion of their fairness. Um, the exception to that was some of the special treatments in, um, I'm forget, a double feature, I want to call it, where they really made the art kind of muted. But again, that didn't have the same uh, um, extra baggage that came with the conversation about particularly foreign languages and then uh, you know these pieces of art that aren't that don't fit because they're not you know, conforming to the same type of uh, art that other game pieces do. So I did look into that and I, I was I was pretty sure that uh, it wasn't a repeat of the same type of discourse. All right. Well, so thank you again to all of the presenters for a really fantastic uh, panel number two. Uh, we have about a half an hour and then panel number three will begin. Panel number three is called Breaking the Table, and the moderator for that uh, panel will be Edmund Chang. Um, so please, uh, you know, get up, stretch, drink some water, and then when you make it back, um, we will have panel number three up and running. And thank you guys for attending, and thank you again to the panelists for all your hard work. <laughs>